Hey guys, thanks for joining us online today. We are so glad that you stopped by to see what God's doing here at Family Church. Now, if this message or any other message that you've listened to has changed your life in any way, we want to hear about it. So email us at changedlife at familychurch.tv. Now, if you'd like to become a deeper part of what God's doing here at Family Church, you can help out by giving online. Just go to our homepage, click on the Give tab, and follow the instructions. Thanks again for joining us today. Today we're going to jump right into the teaching because we do have we do have a lot of ground to cover. I'm in a series right now called When Good People Make Bad Choices. And we're talking about both the results of the bad choices that we sometimes make and how that God always provides a rescue. Now, I don't know about you, but I am particularly thankful that God always provides a rescue for the dumb things that I sometimes do. God is a rescuer. And since we are created in his image, we often feel the need to rescue others. But we need to keep in mind that God rescues us when we're ready. And if you're always rescuing someone before they're ready, you're not rescuing them, you're enabling them. And so I appreciate your heart and I appreciate the fact that you care about people and you love people. And I don't know who this is for, but this was big in me this morning when I woke up. When we rescue people before they're ready, we're really not rescuing them, we are enabling them. And so if we're going to be like God, we need to wait and rescue them when they're ready to change. You follow me? Okay. If you have your Bible this morning, you can turn with me to Proverbs chapter 4. And before we start, I will say that it's going to be, it's going to be tough to, to compete with what happened on this stage last Sunday morning. And... A lot of people thought that, that James had no idea that I was going to cut his hair. But I'm not to, about to make that bad choice. <laughs> and so he knew, just so you know, I would never disrespect him by cutting his hair without his permission. And so we, I had called him earlier in the week and I said, hey, how about we cut your hair on Sunday? It will be so fun, I promise. And it turned out that it was fun and it was awesome. Um, but I did not do that without his permission, just so you know. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says this. It says, above, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly in front of you. Make level paths for your feet. Take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your feet from evil. And I love that verse. And in those verses, we are, we are told to guard four things. We're told to guard our hearts, our mouths, our eyes, and our feet. And in a moment, we're going to look at a Bible story that involves all four of those things. Now, Here's what I know. I know that your life up until this point is a reflection of all the choices that you have made in the past. So physically, financially, morally, spiritually, your life up until this point is a reflection of all the choices that you've made in the past. Now, if you don't like your reflection in any of those areas, you have the power to change that. How do you change that, Pastor Larry? Well, your future reflection isn't based upon your past. It's based upon the choices that you are making right now. So in the scripture, that's called sowing and reaping. So every time you sow a choice, you reap a result. Now get this, guys. If you will keep sowing good seed, it will eventually choke out all the bad seeds that you've sown. And so a lot of people look back at their past and they feel like that they can't change it. 
and that the future is just going to be one big repetitive motion of everything that they've been through, but that's not true. Because if you start sowing good seed, eventually the good seed will grow and it will choke out the bad seed and then you can move on with God's plan and God's purpose for your life, okay? Now, today we're going to talk about another bad choice that a lot of good people make. And, and that's the choice of whether or not to tell the truth by being completely honest, especially when it's easier to lie. So today we're not only going to talk about lying, we're going to talk about how to tell if someone is lying to you. Okay, now I want to start with some information. There are basically seven reasons why we lie. I want to give you these real quick. Seven reasons why we lie. Number one, to take what is not rightfully ours. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning in the Bible story. Number two, to escape accountability. This is when one of your kids says to you, I didn't break that lamp. I don't know how that stain got on the carpet. Wasn't me. Number three, to create a fantasy to escape our own mundane lives. This is when we say, I'm really boring and no one cares about what's going on in my life and so I'm just going to make up a big story um, and, and lie about it. Number four, to avoid punishment. Number five, to inflict pain like through spreading gossip. Number six, to feel better in the moment or to steal admiration. And so that would be like if someone says to you, hey, I was, uh, I was a Marine. And they say, oh, really? I was a Navy SEAL. So that would be an example of that. Um, and number seven, to gain an advantage or to exploit someone else. And that's also in our Bible story this morning. Now, let me give you some facts. Um, 60% of people cannot go more than 10 minutes without lying. Do you know any of those people? I see a few hands out there. The number one lie that people tell is this. Nothing is wrong with me. I'm fine. See, some of you thought this teaching wasn't going to apply to you. Have you ever said that you're fine when you're not fine? Okay, that's a lie. <laughs> Something I thought was interesting, we can only tell if someone is lying about half the time. So 50% of the time, we don't even know if someone's telling us the truth or if someone is lying to us. This is kind of, this is kind of funny. Um, children begin using deception as early as six months. We call this fake crying. <laughs> And, and apparently, some people never grow out of it. <laughs> the average person lies three times a day. I uh, was doing a little research and I, I found out that, that men and women lie differently. Because the number one lie that a man tells is this. Um, I'm sorry I missed your call. Listen, we're not sorry. <laughs> right, Sky? <laughs> we're not sorry. We saw you. <laughs> but we're not sorry. The number one lie that a woman tells is, it was on sale. <laughs> we know it wasn't. So we all lie differently. We all lie differently. But it's serious because when your life is woven together with lies, it comes apart very easily. The truth, however, is binding. The truth keeps the fabric of your life tightly knit. And I know people whose lives are constantly falling apart. And one of the main reasons why their lives are constantly falling apart is because they cannot tell the truth. 
They simply cannot tell the truth. And so there's a lot of holes in, in their life. And so that's why this teaching is, is so important this morning. Now, what I know is that life is, is like a box of... Crayons. <laughs> Life is like a box of crayons. And I have, I have a box of crayons here this morning. This is Crayola 64 crayons. Now, I went to school in Hartville. And, and if you came to school um, uh, with a box of Crayola 64 crayons with a sharpener in the back, we pretty much knew you were going to be the valedictorian. <laughs> I mean, it was settled. <laughs> I bought this box of crayons. It's been a long time since I looked in a box of crayons. Every box of crayons um, has a white crayon. And it's hardly ever used. It's hardly ever used. We hardly ever use the, the white crayon. And I... I think in life it's just the opposite because it's not the big colorful lies that get most of us. It's the lies that we have colored white that get us. I think we call those white lies. And so we have all these, we have all these bold colors that we hardly ever, I mean I know a few people who lie, you know, they lie red and blue and green and all the primary colors, but I think for most of us, it's white. It's the little white lies that, that sometimes get us, and I think we forget that it's the half-truth. Um, it's the truth that we, have, that we have mixed with what is false that, that gets most of us. And so this morning, we're not going to talk about those big outrageous, out outrageous lies that are completely made up. We're going to talk about those things that we sometimes say that aren't completely true and, and the fallout that comes afterward. And we need to remember that partial truth is still completely false. Partial truth is still completely false. So I'm going to put these, I'm going to put these crayons back over here for now. Um... Have you ever noticed in the armor of God that truth is described as the belt? And those of you who, who wear a belt know that the belt is, is what holds everything in place, right? I, op I take off this belt, I'm going to open up like a can of biscuits. <laughs> Ephesians 6.14, <laughs> stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. That tells me if there is no belt of truth buckled around your waist, you're not going to be standing firm. In fact, life will feel a lot like a slip and slide. Just kind of sliding your way through. And so it's truth that creates stability in our lives. It's truth that, that, that puts a firm foundation underneath us. It's truth that, that, that keeps us on the right path. And I think that's why in the armor, truth is described as the belt. And so today, we're going to go into a Bible story, and we're going to talk about Jacob. Because before God changed his name to Israel and made his descendants into a great nation, he struggled with lying. And, and it was... Um, just kind of part of his character and who he was, but God delivered him from that. We're going to talk about what that deliverance looks like this morning. And I was, I was going through some of the Old Testament Bible stories this week. I found that there were a lot of really good people in the Old Testament that we would consider fathers of the faith that made the bad choice of lying. And interestingly enough, they often lied about the same things. Like Abraham and Isaac both lied about their wives, and I think we can pass that down sometimes to our kids. You know, they hear us lying about certain things or maybe they see us lying on our taxes or 
when we write our tithe check. Okay, let's keep moving. <laughs> and we, we pass that down to them. And so whatever we have going on in our lives today that I guess would be um, in line with lying or deception, we need to really talk about that and get that figured out. So let's start with some history. Remember, we're talking about Jacob. Now, Jacob was the son of Isaac and Rebekah. And you probably already know this, but I want, to, I want to refresh your memory this morning. He had a twin brother named Esau. Now, now Jacob and Esau were very, very different. Does anyone have a sibling that is very different than you? Okay, yeah, my, my little brother and I are, are very, very different. I mean, in fact, we are, um, we are, we are kind of like night and day. And, and that was the case with, with, with Jacob and Esau. Um, I want to give you just, just a, little, uh, a few details about these two, these two brothers. Esau, Esau was a manly man, okay? So he spent all of his time hunting and growing his beard. So when I think about Esau, I think about those guys from Duck Dynasty, You see that show? That's what I think about Esau. Like they're out at the golf course catching frogs out of the water and stuff like that. That's what I think about when I think of Esau. He was, he was, a, manly, he was a manly man. Jacob wasn't like that. Jacob was quiet. And, and he preferred to spend his time at home learning how to cook. When I think of Jacob, I think Jacob would have had his own show on the Food Network. It's just kind of the way my mind works. So these guys were very, very, very different. And yet they were brothers and they were brought up in the same house. Even their personalities were different. Esau was very short-sighted and he lived in the moment. Jacob was a long-range planner. Now, we see this in, in, in Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to be in Genesis chapter 27 in just a moment. If you would like to turn there. But we see evidence of this in Genesis chapter 25. When Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of beans. Now, I like beans, but that is not a good deal. Now, if you put some wilted, some wilted lettuce and onions in those beans, I might make that trade. <laughs> he sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. And that's not what we're talking about, but you can kind of see how different they were. So here's, here's what happened in the story. Jacob's father Isaac is about to die. And according to the culture, before his death, he was to speak a blessing over the firstborn son. The firstborn son being Esau. The blessing was very important and it could not be reversed. What did it include? It included abundance, power, prosperity, and victory over enemies. How many of you know that's a pretty important blessing? I would want that for my life. And so look what Isaac says to Esau in Genesis chapter 27, verse 3. This is, this is Isaac speaking to his oldest boy, Esau. He says, now then, get your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now remember at this point, Jacob had already stolen Esau's birthright. And now he is about to lie in order to get his blessing as well. But he had help because he learned how to lie from his mother. And her name was Rebecca. She was the accomplice. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 6. Rebecca said to her son Jacob, look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, bring me some game. And prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give it to you, give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. 
Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. See, guys, if she makes your perfect meal, it's not always in your best interest. <laughs> then take it to your father to eat. Look at this. So that he may give you his blessing before he dies. So now the plot thickens. And we're not going to tell the whole story, but I'll kind of give you the highlights. Jacob liked the idea, but he was nervous. And he was nervous because his brother was a very hairy man. Um, he was a very smooth-skinned man. And so what if Isaac found out that he was lying to him and pronounced a curse over him instead of a blessing? So he was nervous about the whole thing and about the plan and how it would go down. And so Rebecca had a way around that too. Why? Because liars always have an angle. And we see this in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 15. Look what she does. And this is really important because it's going to teach us how to recognize when someone's lying to us. Genesis 27 verse 15 says, Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with goat skins. Now, Esau must have been a really hairy man. You think your husband is hairy? Does he feel like a goat? I see some heads going like this. He was so hairy that she had to put goat skins on Jacob so that he would believe that he was Esau. It says in the scripture that she covered him. But in reality, she was covering for him. And here's the lesson. Anytime you are covering for someone to conceal a truth, you are just as guilty as they are. So she wasn't just covering him, she was covering for him. And so Jacob goes to see Isaac and this is what he says. Genesis 27 and verse 19. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Jacob said, eat some of my game. Jacob had game. And so do liars. It's a game they have played on more than one occasion. Liars rig the game board so that they move forward while everyone else loses a turn. Now get this. When someone starts questioning a liar's story, they always have an answer. And we find, we find it in Genesis 27 and verse 20. It gets, it's really interesting. Um, because Isaac's a little suspicious. And so he says in Genesis 27 verse 20, Isaac asks him, How did you find, find it so quickly, my son? Now look what he says. The Lord your God gave me success. He replied. Wow. As is always the case, one lie requires another. First he lies about his identity and now he's lying about the speed of the hunt and he had the audacity to mention God. The best liars know exactly what to say so that the story doesn't fall apart. Jacob knew that his father trusted in the Lord and he would believe that the Lord gave him a successful hunt. And there's another lesson. A good liar will always add familiar details to the lie in order to sell the story. I'm not sure if I'm helping you or teaching you how to lie. <laughs> Some of you are like, oh, that's a good, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So when you're a good liar, there are three things that you will do. Don't take notes. <laughs> when you're a good liar, number one, you know exactly how much truth to add in order to be believable. Number one. Number two, you spin the story in a way that removes all suspicion. Number three, you use pre-existing facts to keep the deception going. The familiar always feels right. And Jacob is a perfect example of how to tell a believable lie. Isaac, his father, he was not totally convinced. Remember, he was blind. So Jacob comes in and, and something doesn't sound right. So he made a request in Genesis 7 and verse 20, Genesis 27 and verse um, 21. Look what he says. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so that I may touch you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. He blessed him. And when I read that, there's so many things that jump out at me. And the first thing that jumps out of me is this. To Isaac, it felt right, but it sounded funny. It felt right, but it, but it sounded funny. And one of the surefire ways to recognize when someone is lying to you is to trust the voice, not the feel. If you think about someone, if you think someone is lying to you, listen to what they are saying rather than trust the environment they have created. And here's why. Just like Jacob, the best liars will distract you. Isaac was distracted by hairy arms. He thought that it was Esau. So ladies, if your husband comes home three hours late with a bouquet of flowers, don't be distracted by those flowers. <laughs> Find out why he was late. He was, he was distracted. And so let's, let's keep going here. Isaac takes the bait and he blesses Jacob. And then Jacob barely leaves Isaac's tent when Esau comes in um, with the meal that he had just prepared for his father. And, and Esau is devastated when he finds out what Jacob had done to him. Okay, now that brings us to our second point. Lying, number two, takes trust out of the relationship. Okay, now stay with me. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 41. It says, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Basically, he says, my dad's going to die soon. And then I will kill my brother Jacob. So lying takes the trust away. Everything that has been said or will be said is measured against the lie. Now, trust can be reestablished over time, but that's a different teaching. We're not going to talk about that this morning. But here's what does happen. Once again, Rebecca gets involved. And, and once she receives word of what Esau was planning to do, she goes to Jacob and she says, you need to leave and you need to go live um, with your uncle Laban. And we read this in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 44. This is Rebecca talking here. She says, stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I will send word for you to come back from there. Okay? Now, that's a very interesting story and one that we can learn a lot of things from. And we know that lying can be a difficult habit to break, and here's why. It's part of our old nature and most of us have a lot of practice. If we started doing it when we were six months old, how many of you know we have a lot of practice? It's part of, it's part of that, our flesh. It's part of that, that part of us that never gets born again. And so look what Paul says about this in Colossians chapter 3. 
and verse 9 through 10. Paul says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices. Let's stop right there. That tells me that lying is a part of, of that, that old person that you and I no longer want to be. And after we get born again, some of our old hang-ups and our old habits, they don't just immediately go away, right? We have to work on those things. How many of you are still working on a few things? We're supposed to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so those things don't just immediately fall off. It's like, oh, I got saved. You, you don't wake up the next morning with a halo. You have to actively start working on those things. And I, I really believe that lying is one of those things that you and I have got to recognize within ourselves and then become very proactive about reversing that behavior. And how do we do that? Well, Paul keeps going and he says, you know, he says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. And then he goes on and says, having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of our creator. Now, we know that our creator is absolute truth and we're going to read a verse about that in just a moment. And so if our cre creator is absolute truth, then, then our lives should look like absolute truth. And that means we tell the truth even when it's difficult or hard to do. It's not always easy to tell the truth. One thing I... I've said for years, and I believe it, when it comes to the truth, the truth will, will do one of two things. The truth will, will either set you free or make you mad. And most of the time, it'll make you mad first before, before it has the power to set you free. But the truth is what it is and we can't change it. Now, let's, let's keep going here. We're almost done. Lying is one of those things that you must be deliberate about avoiding. It's a game that you must choose to stop playing. Um, let me tell you how the story ends before I forget. The story does end well. Um, if you keep reading, Jacob, re um, he, Jacob wrestles with God um, over his past, and he, he changes. Um, God gives him a new name. God gives him a fresh start, and he eventually patches things up with his brother Esau. And so maybe there's someone in your life that you have lied to. Maybe you did it for whatever your reasons were at the time. And maybe, maybe that relationship is, is damaged. Well, if Jacob could patch things up with Esau, then I believe that, that you can patch things up with whoever that you are at odds with. And the way that you do that is you go to them and you tell them the truth. And then you begin to work on the relationship. And God will help you. So, so here's the lesson. Whenever you change your behavior, you change your outcome. Um, I do want to read two more verses. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 9 says this. A false witness will not go unpunished. And one who breathes out lies will perish. Now that's kind of a hard verse, but can we all agree that, that punishment is not a good outcome? So if we want to change the outcome, what do we need to do? Change the behavior. We have, to, we have to be deliberate and decide that we're going to stop doing that. We see that it's not helping, it's not moving us forward, and it's sure not making the relationship better. And so when we change the behavior, we change the outcome. Now, when it comes to telling the truth... It's not, just, it's not just that we tell a little fib here and there. It's not just that we pull out that white crayon and tell a little white lie once in a while. It's not just manipulating the situation in our favor. 
No, the scripture says that deception of any kind is lying. And, and you may say, well, so what? Well, here's the what. When you do that, God is bound by his word to remove his blessing from you. Now, when my kids were little, they didn't lie to, to us a whole lot. But when they did, we removed the blessing. <laughs> we didn't kick them out of the family. Well, sometimes we did, but... We, we didn't kick them out of the family. We, we just removed the blessing. So if the blessing was, you know, a game or the blessing was whatever it was, we, we removed the blessing. And, that, and that's the thing about lying. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but God is bound by his word to, to remove his blessing from us whenever we're not being truthful. I like, what, I like what Mark Twain said. Mark Twain said, when you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. Why? Because the truth is always the truth, no matter how many ways you tell it. But someone who lies is constantly changing and spinning their story. So if you struggle with lying, my best advice is John 16, 13. John 16, 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. What does that mean? That means when you catch yourself bending the truth, pray that the spirit of truth will straighten you. Pray that the spirit of truth will straighten you. I love that. You and I, Jacob at the time, the Holy Spirit had not yet come in fullness. And so Jacob at the time did not have the fullness of the spirit of truth living inside of him. But guess what? You do. You do. And if the spirit of truth lives inside of you, then the spirit of truth can straighten you. I'm going to be honest. There are times I need some straightening. And there are probably some times that you need some straightening. Because let me tell you something about God. He gets no pleasure in removing his blessing from you. In fact, he gets his pleasure from blessing you. So you don't want to be the one to tie his hands. You want to be the one that keeps the lines of communication open so that he can bless you with all of the things that he has planned from you, for you from the very beginning. We're going to go ahead and stop right there this morning. Um, you can stand with me. Let's just stand. We're going to pray. And we're going to sing another song together before we go. But, you know, I, I, I think that... Um, I think that no matter who you are or, or how... Um, how spiritually mature you are... I, th I think there's just a certain amount of covering that we do sometimes for ourselves. And, and maybe it goes back to just when someone comes to you and says, you know, Pastor Kevin, how, how are you doing today? And you're not fine, but you say, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> I think there's a certain amount in, in all of us that where we could do better. I, I know that's true for me. Okay, so let's pray this morning. Lord, I'm, I'm thankful today that the spirit of truth lives inside of me and that, that even though I have, I have this old nature, even though I have this flesh that, that, that I contend with um, on a daily basis, that, that flesh that, that, would, that would try to convince me that, that maybe I need to bend things to my advantage, um, that maybe I... I don't lie, but I don't tell all the truth either so that it appears to be one way when it's actually another way. Lord, whatever that looks like, um, I, I, I know, God, that you, you want to help me with that. You want to help me to, to live in a way that, where I'm transparent. And, and Lord, you, you want to help me to, uh, to have good relationships. And Lord, that even means being in a good relationship with you. 
and, and coming to you like, like, like the psalmist David often did and, and was just honest about how he felt. He wasn't hiding anything. He wasn't, he wasn't pretending to be anything that he wasn't. And I, and I pray for that kind, of, that kind of truth to be in me. Lord, to, to, have, to have that kind of truth in me where I can come before you and say, you know what, I, I, I don't like this and, and I, I, I'm struggling and I need help today. And so God, I, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for, this, for the spirit of truth. I'm so thankful that he, that he is a delivering spirit and that he helps me. We read in Proverbs, not, not to swerve to the right or to the left. And the spirit of truth helps me to stay on that, on that right path. And I don't want to have to learn the hard way like Jacob. I don't want to create problems in my family because I can't tell the truth. I don't want to spend years struggling and wrestling with life because I wasn't able to keep my story straight. I want to walk in freedom. So today as we're praying, I want you to, I want you to just do a little bit of reflection this morning. And, you know, I, I, on, obviously this is something that kind of catches all of us at a different angle, but maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's someone in your life and and you're, you, are, you are just lying to them right now. Maybe, maybe you're lying to them about how you're spending money or where you're actually at when you say you're one place and you're not there. Or maybe you're here and you're a teenager and you're, you're lying to your parents and you're involved in things they don't even, they don't even know about. This would be a really good time for you to just come clean before the Lord and, and talk to Him about that. Lord, today, I, um, I'm grateful and thankful that you don't give up on us. And Lord, even though sometimes we, we do make our bed, we don't have to lie in it. At any moment, we can, we can choose to get up out of all those bad choices and get on a better path. And I believe and know that that's happening in this place this morning. And we don't have to end up like Jacob and we don't have to turn people against one another. We don't. Help us to not make that bad choice today in Jesus' name. Amen.